Okay. So again, we're talking about funding opportunities, community care, and COVID mitigation today. Um, and I'm Nina, I'm the program manager. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm going to do a presentation that may be about 15 minutes. Um, and I ask that you just hold any questions that you have until the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any tech issues during my presentation or uh, you're having trouble hearing me or anything, feel free to raise your hand. But for any questions um, regarding any of these topics that we're talking about today, please do hold until the end of the presentation. Um, all right. So we begin all art and feminism events. Um, we begin all art and feminism events with our Brave Friendly Space Agreement. This is something that um, you all should also be using in your art and feminism events. So if you haven't, or if you're new, this is a reminder um, that we, we intend to create brave and friendly spaces whenever we're hosting an art and feminism event. Um, so I'll, I'll read this excerpt and encourage you all to visit the link um, at the bottom of the page, which would take you to the full agreement. So the goal of this session is to create an encouraging space for collective learning. This requires intentional behavior wherein participants are conscious of and accountable for the effect of their statements and actions on others. We respect our experiences and the experiences um, of others and recognize that we can't do this work without one another. We agree to hold each other accountable to foster a brave, friendly space. So that's you holding me accountable, me holding you accountable, you all holding each other accountable for um, your behavior and actions within um, this particular space, but all art and feminism spaces. Today, we're going to cover rapid grants, art and feminism microfunding, and community care and COVID mitigation. I've shared the link in the chat. I know there's some um, new people who have come in. So if uh, the people who have been here don't mind resharing that link for um, other participants so that they can follow this along, follow along with this presentation. There's the quick guide to funding. Um, which is linked on this slide and everything that I'm gonna present today, you can find in this funding guide. So if anything, if you miss anything, you can always go there for reference. Okay, so we'll start with rapid grants. Rapid grants are, um, they are a program administered by the Wikimedia Foundation. The amount that you can receive in a rapid grant is up to 5,000 US dollars. I think the minimum is maybe around 500 US dollars. Um, this is something again, that's administered by the Wikimedia Foundation. So art and feminism doesn't have um, any say in the decision-making process. Uh, we don't set the deadlines and any questions that you have around rapid grants, you should reach out to your program officer. I've included their email addresses on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, but this is something that, although we don't administer, this is something that we really encourage our organizers to consider applying for, especially when you're doing um, something that's like a multi-event um, art and feminism project or something that's a little bit more than just um, a one-off event. Um, and you can see, in, this, in the presentation, you can see the guidelines there for applying. Um, make sure that you meet all of the criteria um, before you start your application. And then there's also the link to the application. If you've applied to a rapid grant before, then you know that this year is a little bit different and that everything has been moved over to Flux. Um, so that's a new system, and I would encourage you, if you are going to apply, make sure you give yourself enough time to kind of adjust to the different expectations that are now um, involved with applying through Flux. If you're not applying to a rapid grant this year, then I want to encourage you to review some of the art and feminism submissions 
the link is there in the yellow on the screen. That's everyone who submitted a rapid grant that is an art and feminism organizer. If you see something that sounds like really exciting and something that you would support, go ahead and add your endorsement to their application. Um, that's one way to be a part of the art and feminism community is not just attending these events and hosting your own events, but also supporting other event organizers. So that's a small act that you can do today. Um, and again, rapid grants is not art and feminism. So unfortunately, if you have questions about rapid grants, I may not be able to answer them, but I would encourage you to reach out to your program officer. Okay, so things that I can talk to you about and things that I can answer questions about is the art and feminism microfunding process. <clears throat> This is money that we receive from the Wikimedia Foundation to distribute um, within our community. So the funding is smaller than the rapid grant. Rapid grants start at 500 US dollars. Art and feminism microfunding goes up to $250. So it's usually between around 125 and 250. Um, and we increase the amount during the pandemic to help people cover things like um, the cost of Zoom or any other technology. So that's something to consider um, when you're planning your event and what you are requesting funding for. Um, we do follow, because this, these are Wikimedia funds, we do follow um, kind of a similar eligibility criteria. So um, if you see, if you review, you know, the eligibility criteria for the rapid grants, that's pretty much what we're looking for, um, just to make sure that we are also um, in alignment with how the foundation is operating. And that means, you know, what you can spend money on also is dictated based off of what the foundation um, decides you can spend money on. There are three aspects to um, the art and feminism microfunding process that I want to cover today. First is our community care statement. The second is our COVID precautions for in-person events. And the last is the application form. Um, so I said before that we increased the amount of funding that you could receive from us because of the pandemic and wanting people, um, wanting our event organizers to be fully resourced to host virtual events. Um, but now as more people are doing in-person events, uh, we do wanna emphasize uh, um, our community care statement is a source for us to build a practice around. Um, and so it's not just words, but something that we want to actually live. These are our values in terms of um, how we keep each other safe during a pandemic. Um, so yeah, I'll start there. And I'm going to read um, some excerpts from our community care statement. Um, and I'm going to ask on the next slide for one of you to volunteer, but I'll read this, this part and explain them a little bit. Um, you can read the full statement on our website. It's also available on Meta if you um, find it easier to access it there. Uh, so there are three kinds of things, three groups of questions that we're, we're asking our event organizers to consider when they're planning their events. So the first is what is the safest for the most vulnerable people who want to or will attend your event, including the staff at the venues that you're working, that you're hosting your event at and your community at large. Um, so you all know Art and Feminism is a feminist project. We're here to um, document and write the histories of people who have been written out of history, women and non-binary non people. Um, we're here to document um, that history, and that's the history of people who have been pushed into marginalized position and people who have been made vulnerable um, in the societies in which we live. And so when we're thinking about the work that we do, we're also thinking about how we do the work. So it's great that everyone um, is here to work on the things that we're here to work on, but we also want to consider how we how we do that work. And so always ask like, who's the most vulnerable in my community and what would be safest for them to attend this event? Um, and then if you're hosting, and for some people that answer may be that it's a virtual event. Um, and you know, COVID is, people are having different experiences around the world with COVID. Um, 
And so there are some instances where virtual is, is the safest for everyone. Um, and then there's some instances where um, if you put protective measures in place, then having an in-person event um, can be can happen successfully. So that's another question that you wanna ask. If holding an in-person event, what are the health and safety precautions that you're going to take? And how are you communicating that with your participants in advance? So thinking about not just, okay, we're gonna have masks at our event, but how do you communicate that so that participants can plan ahead of time, um, whether to bring their mask or be prepared to receive a mask or, um, preparing that they're gonna be sitting outside or any any kind of precautions that you're setting up, you have to communicate that to your participants. And then the last set of questions, how can you create a meaningful way for the community to participate virtually? And what are the accessibility needs for a virtual event? We have created a virtual event guide. That's something we did in 2020 which is still available for you all to use. And it's something that I encourage event organizers to consider um, as an add-on to your event is our offer a way for people to attend virtually. Um, editing is something that, you know, we are all on our laptops anyways. And so creating the opportunity for people to participate virtually um, is always helpful. Um, not just considering that there may be more vulnerable people who want to participate, but also if anyone who was planning to come is sick and doesn't want to um, get anyone else sick, but they still want to participate, they can participate from home um, if you have a virtual a virtual component to your event. So that, that's the first excerpt from the community care statement. Again, the link is at the top. Um, the second excerpt, I'm going to ask one of you to volunteer to read it. Um, does anyone want to raise their hand or unmute and start reading? Yeah, I'm reading. Hello. Does anyone want to volunteer? I said I'm reading. Okay, you may have to um, raise your voice a little bit. It's kind of difficult to hear. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead and start. Just make sure you raise your voice a bit more. Okay. We encourage you to organize a virtual event or create a meaningful virtual component to an in-person event as a way of minimizing risk for those who are most vulnerable. Microfunding is available to help offset the cost for things like masks, eye protection, and other personal protective equipment, in brackets, PPE, among, along with tests, keeper, air, Super air, research, and hybrid technology. We have generated a separate list of considerations for COVID 19 precautions for in person events, including resources and recommendations around ventilation, math, test, communication, and example. Thank you. Um... I can't see like who's speaking and everything right now, but thank you for volunteering to read that. Um, so again, this is just just a reminder that you know we've increased funding initially for you know Zoom use, but also um, now that we're doing more in-person stuff, then you know you can consider using your funding for um, other things like mask and eye protection, etc. Um, so again, make sure you read the community care statement before um, you submit your uh, art and feminism microfunding application. Um, and it also links to this guide, the COVID precautions for in-person events. 
Um, so if you're looking at the slide deck, you'll see on the next slide, there's the link to, to that guide. And that has information from uh, the United States Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization. So resources um, that they have put together around, um, around mitigation for COVID. Um, so I, I hope that you'll check that out and make sure that you try to apply some of those to your event. Now, lastly, when it comes to applying to the Art and Feminism Micro Fund, um, there's the application form. And so that form is going to ask you, you know, for basic things like, you know, which region you're located in, um, your name and your email address. It's also going to ask you um, if you've read the community care statement. Um, and then it'll ask you for your COVID mitigation statement. This is a common error that people have made this year. Um, in the first couple of years of the pandemic, uh, we required that people submit their risk assessment. Um, and that was a tool that the foundation had created for people to assess risk uh, when hosting events. Um, and now the foundation has archived that and is no longer actively using it. It is something that I say is still a good um, tool to use if you do wanna um, assess risk in your community um, when you're hosting an event or planning to host an event. But the only thing that we're requiring is a COVID mitigation statement. And this is the statement that you will be making public to participants so that they know these are the precautions that um, you can expect to participate in when you come to our event. So similar to our Brave Friendly Space Agreement, you know, this is uh, something that you want to share ahead of time so that people know like, you know, I'm not coming and just going to like do whatever, but there's a set of agreements that I have to um, agree to to participate in this event. Um, and then the other thing, and I'll give an example, I'll show an example of the next slide, but the other thing that is a common error is um, not reviewing the application deadlines. So when it comes to microfunding, the deadline is the 15th on the month prior to your event. So if you're hosting um, an event for March, then the deadline was February 15th. If you're hosting an event in April, then March 15th is the deadline. So that's something to keep in mind. Art and Feminism is a really small staff. We do not um, review applications on an ongoing basis. We review them once a month. Um, and it's really important that you read through that application and submit everything that is requested as it is requested. Um, I I have gotten a lot of uh, a lot of applications that have submitted uh, documents that I can't access, or they submitted like links to Google documents that I can't access, or they're submitting um, the risk assessment tool, but not the COVID mitigation statement. And if you make those errors in your application, that will delay your application review. I want to emphasize that that will delay your application review. Applications are only reviewed once per month. And if um, and if you do not receive funding prior to your event, um, you have two options. Either you can adjust the date of your event or you can wait um, after you've corrected you know, any errors on your application, collect any receipts for expenses that you incurred for your event and submit that information afterwards. Okay. Here is an example of a COVID mitigation statement that was included for an event that took place, an art and feminism event that took place in Vietnam earlier this month. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to read the white box on the screen? And I'm going to ask that if you volunteer, just go ahead and read because I can't see any hands or anything. Okay, um, can I read? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, um, so the community care reminder, as part of safety regulations against COVID-19, please bring a mask to the event and please consider canceling your visit if you are experiencing any symptoms, such as coughing or fever. And if you have forgotten protective gear at home, don't worry, we will have extra masks and sanitizers at the space. 
Thank you. Um, so this was a statement that the organizers um, put together to show, you know, any participants what to expect when they come to the event. Um, I think it would have been wonderful if they also had a virtual um, component, but this is what they offered. And I think it's really important that they communicated this so that people know, bring your mask, but if you don't have a mask, we'll bring one for you. Um, and they included that statement on their event listing and on their dashboard, which is what we ask people to do. Um, we're not asking for these statements for art and feminism just to keep for ourselves. We are asking for you to present it to your community and potential participants. Um, as you know, this work is something that we are trying to bring more people in to do this work with us. And so, you know, a lot of people organize events with their user group or people they already know, but we want to make sure that we're making a welcoming space for people who are new. So there may be, you know, um, an event that you're hosting where you are expecting a bunch of editors that you already know, but if they see your event, if someone new sees your event on Art and Feminism website and they want to attend, make sure that you're communicating um, things clearly so that they can they can be prepared uh, for what to bring to your event. Um, yeah, and there are more examples. If you look at the guide, we've included some examples from different types of events. I'll say a lot of this um, is uh, examples that are written in English and are US based. So if you have other examples that you want to share with art and feminism, we would love to see those examples. You can email us, um, and I have our email on the next page, but you can email us and say, here are some resources that are available in this language or in this different um, geographical region that are that can be shared with the art and feminism community. You can also take a look at our calendar. Um, just going on our artandfeminism.org and looking on the events page, you can see other event organizers, what they're sharing with um, with uh, potential attendees. Okay, so that is the, like I said, that was the brief presentation. Um, I want to remind you that if you are um, an event organizer already, that you should be connecting to your um, Art and Feminism Regional Ambassador. If you have not been connected um, yet, you can always reach out. Their email addresses are available on our website. You can also email us at info at artandfeminism.org if you have um, any questions beyond this. 